Good afternoon. I hope uh, you had a good lunch and break. So we are happy to continue for session number three. And for that, I would like to invite the presenters and the chair to come to the stage. So now I would like to uh, present uh, Anjala Gopalan. Uh, she's the founder and executive director of the NAS Foundation in India, Trust, a Delhi-based NGO dedicated to fighting HIV-AIDS. Established in 1994, NAS Foundation provides support to stigmatized and vulnerable communities HIV. In 2000, Anjali also founded the NAS Care Home to provide a safe and supportive environment for children living with HIV. The home employs a holistic approach to look after the nutritional, educational, medical and psychological needs of each child and has been designated as the only care center for children in the entire northern region. Bestowed with several prestigious awards, Anjali also spearheaded an eight-year legal battle on 377 of the Indian Penal Code with the court ruling in favor of NAS India. Welcome, and I hope, also welcome to the other presenters, and I hope we have, again, a very engaging session. Thank you. And welcome to this session. Uh, we have two speakers, and I've been told to actually keep time, so I'm not usually rude by nature, but I may sound so right now. So we have two speakers with us, One, and, and the first speaker is Paul Lungdem, who has been working as a coordinator at the Delhi Network of Positive People since 2013 and is responsible for coordinating projects concerning expanding access to essential services, increased treatment adherence, reduce stigma and discrimination, and improve the quality of life of people living with HIV. His HIV status was confirmed in 1995 and he has retroviral treatment since April 2013. Um, so may I, uh, Paul is going to um, share his thoughts on monitoring stockouts in, na in the National AIDS Program facilities in India. This is a case study that was done by DNP+. And the way this works is after the second, so we'll take questions after both presenters are finished, as we have some time for uh, doing precisely that. Oscar, my name, my name is Paul Hundim. I'll be presenting on monitoring stockout in National AIDS Program facilities in India. DNP Plus mission is to improve treatment services for people living with HIV, monitoring stockout or shortage of ARV, OI medicines, or diagnostic kit in ART program. We started monitoring stockout shortage at government antiretroviral therapy ART center. Our methodology uh, in this ma for monitoring stockout is uh, we monitor stock monitoring of stock of ARV and diagnostic at ART center in Delhi from the last eight years. And I'm going to present retrospective study of daily monitoring of all nine ART center in Delhi from June 2012 to February 2015. This study has met the MSF Ethic Review Board approved criteria for analysis of routinely collected program data because uh, it is DNP uh, uh, daily activities to carry out daily uh, uh, stock of ARV or kits, PLTs maintained, and no harm is uh, done to the PLHIV as confidentiality is maintained. Uh, PLHIV has complete trust on DNP plus. And this is the ART center in Delhi. What we did is we screen ART cards identify treatment interruption. We ask patients about their experiences issue with ARV or testing, whether they have received uh, the required amount, quota of ARV, or whether they have got tested for their routine test. And we question staff working in the ART center, ART center on availability of essential supply. And here I'll like to uh, ex uh, explain a bit more on stockout. What exactly is stockout man? Stockout man, no physical stock of medicine and kids. And shortage mean medicines were given for less than the designated one month supply to patients. 
Routine tests not available on designated date for monitoring and diagnosing resistance. Our results shows that uh, 32 ep episodes were recorded on shortages, and just in 2014, 15 episodes were out of the 32 recorded episodes. And this resulted in repetitive ART visit, ART center visit by patients. So, because since they are not getting one month quarter, they have to visit. Uh, they are told uh, 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 after 15 days or after three days. And even some have to shift uh, their regime from field to SLN uh, Starbudin, and it uh, hampered their economic, economically, uh, travel costs or they have to purchase with their own money. And uh, last but the, not the least, they are psychologically affected. And this is two pictures of how we recorded evidences of stock up or shortages. In the first picture, we uh, saw the circle uh, shows that stavudin is given in place of tenofovil. The patient has to be given tenofovil, but uh, since there is stock out, stavudin was given. And in the second picture, we can see three days in the circle mark. So the patient has, uh, was supposed to get one month, but due to stock out or shortage, uh, due to a shortage of ARV, uh, three days was given, three day dose was given to the patient. And this is the letter sent to uh, Security, Sec uh, Secretary Health Minister uh, regarding uh, stock out of viral load kits. We have the two letters to NACO official uh, regarding viral load testing kit stock out, but we met no response. So uh, we went ahead and sent this letter to health minister uh, trying to make him aware that uh, viral load testing kit had been uh, on stock out uh, for the past one year. How we tried resolving it? Some with technical support from MSF assist campaign. We met NACO officials, we met uh, procurement agencies like rights, uh, we met uh, procurement agency rights because uh, they were, uh, they, there is a, de a delay in uh, time uh, issuing of a procurement or tender and direct ARV manufacturers so that can, they can bid for timely. When they are not bidding timely, uh, there is a, a shortage or, uh, or uh, ARV or kids. And when such thing happens, stock out or shortages happen, we we'll roll letters to the WHO, uh, HIV department, UNAIDS, Global Fund, and Pediatric Supplier to make them aware of uh, stock position, the stock out position. And when nothing, uh, when the stock out is happening a long time, we even send uh, legal notice to health ministry. And when repetitive stock out shortages continues, we even intimate and engage media or journalists, and with their our issues and concerns are published in articles in national and international media. And these are a few pictures. The first and second picture shows of our uh, sit-in protest at NACO office. Uh, the first picture uh, picture is in 2011 uh, when there was uh, ARV uh, nation, uh, national wide. So, and the second picture is uh, in 2013 uh, we had another sit-in protest. And, uh, that is the way when we uh, uh, how we work out. And the third picture is showing uh, us having a silent protest at. Uh, 10 year celebration of ART program in India, uh, organized by NACO, to highlight consistent recurring uh, stock of uh, ARV that is hampering PLHIV life. When stock of or shortages uh, continues, uh, there are times when even uh, DNP had to go ahead and purchase drug mm -hmm. ARV for patients. And then monitoring of the supply chain led to identification of stock out shortage in public facility. Resulted in behavior change in cl uh, clinic staff. Uh, they started to inform about stock position. We put Sibla Pharma Company to bid for pediatric formulation. Uh, WHO MSF Clinton Foundation 
emergency donation. Uh, pressure to finalize bid for first line and second line ERT in September 2014. Motivated other positive network to come out and actively report on stock out. Light Mumbai AIDS Forum and Positive Women Network. Limitation. In DN DNP Plus, uh, the limitation, uh, we have no particular staff or resources or fund uh, to do this uh, monitoring. We are just doing extra, that is the limitation. And the situation is still grim. Budget of National AIDS Program further reduced. And the comment made, uh, made by Indian Health Minister, uh, this is what the comment made. AIDS was a concern, that is the uh, mindset. Uh, never ending delay in ensuing and finalizing bids. So monitoring is a challenge. Supply chain reform is still pending and viral load kit stock out is uh, ha happening for the past 12 months. What we need is national mo monitoring system on stocks for, for timely stock out report for, so that timely repl replenishment can be had. Okay, you're 10 minutes over. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, Padma Deosthali, who is the coordinator at the Center for Inquiry into Health and Allied Themes. She was instrumental in founding the Dilasa Public Hospital Crisis Center and sat on the national committee which, under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, developed the national guidelines and protocol for medical legal care to survivors and victims of sexual violence. As a member of the WHO Guideline Development Group Steering Committee, she contributed to establishing clinical guidelines for responding to intimate partner violence and sexual assault. She has undertaken research on standards of care in private sector healthcare, its unregulated growth, women's work, and the health implications of violence against. Uh, Padma is going to speak on making the health, health sector responsive to sexual violence, the lessons learned from this. Thank you. Thank you, Anjali. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, I will. Uh, so this is this presentation is really, as uh, the title suggests, it's lessons learned from an intervention project that we are running in Mumbai. And when we talk about the health sector response to sexual violence, uh, one major thing that we all recognize is that the health sector has a dual role to uh, play when it comes to responding to sexual violence in terms of the clinical and therapeutic care and also the forensic. Uh, before we get into the uh, actual uh, context, what has changed in India is the uh, after the 2012 Delhi incident of brutal sexual assault of the physiotherapist, uh, the legal the, there was there were some legal amendments made. Just a certain legal mandate which further uh, emphasize on the critical role both in terms of therapeutic and uh, forensic on part of the health system. So right to treatment for survivors of sexual violence was not a legal mandate. It was an expected role that the uh, doctors needed to play and not just uh, focus on forensics, but that has come through with the law, both in the CLA 2013 as well as the child sexual abuse law that came in in 2012. There's also a provision for mandatory reporting to and the entire definition of consent as far as rape is concerned has been clarified and the, there is a, a clarification saying that absence of injuries in rape victims does not mean consent and rape has been the definition of rape is expanded from penovaginal uh, penetration to include all orifices anal vaginal and oral and insertion of penis so i think that makes the health system in a very different situation to and a challenge for them to more sensitively now going back to what is the current response of the health system to sexual violence, this is a typical medical legal form uh, that you will find in most health facilities of uh, India across the country. One is that there's informed cons the informed consent is merely a blanket consent which is assumed because it's a case of, it's a medical legal case. So it's a police case, so there is no uh, specific consent for different procedures, so there's a blanket consent taken. History is often written as alleged history of rape without getting into details of the nature of assault. So it's all history of rape. Uh, there's a whole focus on hymen examination. Rupture of the hymen is mentioned prominently without mentioning whether it's an old rupture or you know when the uh, hymen had ruptured. The size of vaginal opening is definitely mentioned 
in almost all cases, whether it's a child, adolescent or an adult. Two fingers pass, one finger passes with difficulty. These are the kinds of comments. Uh, there's no mention of the delay in reporting. What, is the, what did the victim do after the assault? Did she wash herself, clean herself? Uh, what are the use of restraints? So, you know, was she threatened? Uh, any intoxication, the delay in reporting? There's just no mention of that in the medical legal form. Uh, the evidence is collected uh, just as procedure. So it's irrespective of the kind of uh, assault. So if she's reporting anal uh, uh, sexual assault, still her vaginal swab will be taken. So if she's reporting oral, still anal and vaginal will be taken. So there's just no uh, sense. It's just done very mechanically. Irrespective of whether she was menstruating, all the swabs will be taken because that is a procedure to be followed by the doctor. There's no medical opinion, no correlation to her history and what the doctor has found. The most glaring gap is in the absent therapeutic care. Most often treatment may just not be given. Uh, there are cases uh, documented clearly where women have uh, had to come back for abortion because an emergency contraception was not provided or children have been brought back for burning micturation complaints because they were not given any treatment when they, but the medical legal evidence was collected, but the treatment was not provided. This is just to emphasize that, you know, painkillers have been prescribed in the form uh, for the patient for genital injuries, but the doctor has written on the medical legal form that the patient is uncooperative. Instead of saying that a per donation was not possible because of a genital injury, this is the kind of comments that are made. All of this is rooted in the most insensitive gender, you know, uh, absolutely stereotypical notions about rape which are still there in the latest editions of forensic textbooks. There's no time to get into the details, but this presentation is here. So it talks about the kind of, you know, types of women who can resist, who cannot resist. It uh, keep rape is the easiest allegation to make, but difficult to prove. Uh, there's a whole focus on uh, commenting on sexual habituation of women. So they're instructed, the doctor, the medical Te textbooks actually instruct doctors to do all this and this exists in the 2013 editions. Now coming to medical evidence in sexual violence as you all know it could be in the form of trace evidence, it could be injuries on the body or it could be infections. But one needs to understand that medical e evidence has its limitations because there could be gap between when the incident took place and when she reported to the health facilities. The nature of sexual assault will determine what kind of evidence is going to be found, uh, whether a, a condom was used, whether there was intoxication, whether drugs were given. All of this affects the kind of evidence that could be found on a rape victim. Uh, post-assault activities. So the fact if there is no medical evidence, it does not mean that sexual assault did not take place. Coming to the model that we've set up in three hospitals in Mumbai, in collaboration with the mission of uh, Mumbai there, so it's a collaboration between Sehat and three hospitals. We've set up a comprehensive health sector response uh, where informed consent has been operationalized to seek consent for treatment, for evidence collection, for reporting to the police and for collection of evidence. So at all stages for all these four procedures consent is taken and uh, it is for it has been followed for all uh, survivors who report to these hospitals uh, detailed documentation of history of uh, assault there's a gender sensitive examination collection of relevant uh, forensic evidence and provision of a medical opinion uh, there's also medical uh, treatment which is provided free of cost and first contact psychological first aid is provided and a do documented chain of custody has been uh, set up because often we found in most hospitals evidence is collected but it's just lying because there's no documentation as to who in whose care this is supposed to be kept referral to appro appropriate agency so this is the kind of model and what i'm going to talk about is the lessons learned from uh, execution of implementation of this module since 2008 uh, this is based on medical, pro uh, medical, uh, the medical legal protocols that have been maintained. Total cases were 448, and what uh, what's been picked up for analysis is 411, and 17 code been analyzed. We found that after 2012, so 2008 to 12, we had about 94 cases across these three hospitals. And after 2012, which is when the, there was a huge campaign in India, and a threefold increase in the number of survivors coming to these three hospitals. Uh, if you look at the age of survivors, we have about 42% who are less than 12, they are children, another 35% who are adults, and about 23% who are adolescents. Um, Nature of sexual violence, it's non-penetrative assaults, which have been 25%, and I think that's the, 
huge difference that the definition of rape has been changed uh, makes uh, for uh, in terms of access to justice for these survivors. Uh, profile of perpetrators, almost 77% of the in cases, the perpetrator was known to the uh, victim. 25% uh, of these cases followed up for uh, counseling and other. Uh, this is the analysis of legal outcomes. And if you look at, you know, the two 17 minutes. court judgments, two minutes, yeah. Uh, factors leading to conf uh, convictions, we found that the documentation of detailed history by the doctor, the trace evidence when it was explained in terms of presence or absence of trace evidence. So if the ejaculation was her body, so, you know, it was explained that therefore there's no trace of semen. The detection of lubricant, so the absence of injury was explained. The fact that she was menstruating, so the doctor was able to explain that there was no, uh, th therefore there is no forensic evidence. Uh, even injuries were interpreted in terms of, you know, the delay in reporting, the fact that the assault took place 35 days back, so the injuries have healed. Or the redness, the distinction between redness or soreness caused because of sexual violence and that by uh, uh, STD. Uh, factors leading to acquittal, often there was no interpret, the interpretation put up by the doctor for injuries was not picked up by the prosecution. Uh, evidence was not explained. Uh, in an offense of fingering, where the doctor has said that, you know, there was fingering and therefore there is no uh, forensic evidence, the judgment actually and the, the final judgment says absence of semen. So in a case of fingering, you're not going to find semen. Occupation of the judicial system with uh, medical evidence and especially forensic evidence uh, comes through and their biases towards uh, rape comes in. Uh, for offenses of non-penetrative sexual assault also the court asked for, uh, you know, semen. Why was there? Th there's no semen that was uh, found. Uh, of course, there were social factors where cases were withdrawn. Uh, these are details which there's no time to go through, but this presentation will be available. So these are just to, dip, you know, really say what is the, how the doctor explained the medical evidence. What's emerging from this analysis is that for the courts and the prosecution is that they need to recognize infections also as evidence. So even cases, so it, the whole preoccupation is with semen and, you know, injuries. So if that, but infection itself provided, that itself forms, should, uh, needs to be recognized as medical evidence. To conclude, it's possible to, uh, you know, conduct these medical legal in a gender sensitive way. Uh, evidence based scientific uh, forensic practice is absolutely essential and that can uh, really stand the test of time. Uh, doctors need to explain the absence and presence of injuries. Guidance on medical evidence and its limitations has to be added to doctors and prosecution police and the ju judges because there obviously seems to be a lack of uh, recognition of it. Uh, these are few issues that I would like to flag. Uh, one is that mandatory reporting to the police has come in and that really comes in a way, uh, you know, it kind of contradicts the whole right to treatment provision that the law has brought in because those who don't want to report to the police, often they can be denied treatment and informed refusal for informing the police, which has been uh, what we are practicing in these hospitals, is that it really requires ethical practice. Most doctors would like to just go by with the law. So when the law and the ethics, there is a kind of, you know, dilemma, often doctors choose to go the legal way. They don't want to uh, take an option. And this is a problem, especially with women who are reporting, uh, who come for abortion. So often they are reporting rape, uh, after two months, so it really makes no sense for the doctor to mandatorily report to the police. Uh, the other is married women reporting marital rape, and you know what our country and our parliament thinks about marital rape. Uh, we've had about uh, 12 cases within these 441 who reported rape by their husbands or boyfriends. So marital rape is very common, and I think it requires a legal, because the rape law excludes rape by the intimate partner, uh, a criminal case cannot be made by the police. Uh, transgenders and boys are also reporting here. We've had about two transgenders in the last two years, and about 3% uh, of these 411 are boys who reported with sexual violence. Uh, this is to acknowledge the interventionists, because we, have, we are on call to for, for these hospitals and we provide 24-7 uh, on-call services to the doctors and uh, survivors and their families. And uh, lastly, I would like to thank the MSF for uh, having including us for this conference. So thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to end.